Well, it's eight o'clock, everyone. Welcome. We're here for attracting wildlife in the city with Living Your Eco Design and Wise Hands. I'm Amanda, and um, I have a small business located in Pinellas County, Florida, Living Roads Eco Design, and its partner, Pinellas Community Compost. I grew up on a working farm in northern Michigan. I've been gardening my whole life and um, moved to Florida for college and was a teacher for a while, an elementary school teacher. And I worked in our school garden. And um, since becoming a parent, I decided to move into gardening and landscaping to help people make better choices for their yards. Ready for us to say hello, Amanda? Yeah. All right. Um, well, I guess I'm Mallory Foster, and um, Steph and I started Wise Hands about a year ago, thanks to a lead from Amanda, actually, and then went full time into it um, this spring, so a couple months ago. Um, I come from a background. Um, like Amanda had a different career before this. Um, my background's in nutrition um, and permaculture design as well as gardener and kind of bringing it all together now with native plants and uh, veggie gardening and fruit trees. So kind of bringing a bunch of things together to do what we do now. I'll turn it over to Stephen. That's a great introduction, Mallory. Um, and thank you, uh, Amanda, for putting this on. and. Um, yeah, Amanda did help us get our first uh, our first um, uh, consistent client, so that was really cool. And, and um, yeah, definitely thank you for that. Uh, so my name's Stefan. Um, my background is at Wilcox Nursery and Landscape, which if you're in the Pinellas County uh, or Tampa Bay area, you might have heard of. Um, so that's where I learned about native plants. I was a nursery production manager there for about four years. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, and that was that was a great experience. And then started doing side work for a while and, and always wanted to start my own business. And uh, Mallory uh, hopped on and um, left her job with the University of Florida. So that was, that was awesome. Um, and we've been doing this full time since now about um, March and Mallory has been full time with it since April. Um, and uh, yeah, um, native plants, um, all the things we're going to talk about today. And then Mallory's background with, permaculture and edible plants and everything was a really good combination and um, it was definitely a need for uh, the maintenance side of things uh, so that was kind of the impetus to start the whole business as well um, in the native plant world so yeah happy to be here So, so in a food forest or any, any forest, there's all of these, um, these different systems that are interacting together. Um, there are the systems that are above ground that we're all familiar with. There's the birds, the butterflies, the leaves, and um, fruit and larger animals. And even though we live in the city, these things are still there. Um, you may have noticed when it was really quiet during the beginning of social distancing, there were so many birds just singing happily. That's, that was wonderful. But I've noticed since everything's picked back up, it's a little bit quieter. Um, Anyway, one of the things that we're hoping to help you all do tonight is to see how we can begin to restore our damaged and really overpopulated with people kind of ecosystem. Um, how can we restore that and bring back that wildlife, bring back that diversity? And not just so that you can enjoy the butterflies and the birds and the bees when you're sitting in your backyard, but really so that we can have a healthy and thriving ecosystem. It's really easy to forget that humans are um, animals. We're part of nature. And 
when we are a part of nature, we need to be involved in nature. We're a part of this thriving, living web, even though we're not in this image here in this um, artwork. And um, one thing I'd like to point out while we're here is notice what's happening below the surface. There is just as much activity below the surface as there is above. In fact, there's even more activity below the surface. And we're going to talk about how you can help to restore that below the ground ecosystem as well tonight. So here are a few of our local creature helpers, I'm calling them. We have all of these animals living in our, in our urban spaces. I've seen them all except for that particular type of praying mantis there. I've seen them all in my backyard and um, they all have a job to do. They all eat different foods. And if we allow them to do their job, they will really be our partners in helping our, um, our yard, our communities, our ecosystems that we're all a part of. They'll really help to make that balanced. What's happened over the years between development and construction and manicuring yards and lawns and um, redo redoing landscapes and, and applying chemicals, we've really damaged our ecosystem. And you might think, well, I just, I just sprayed the lawn and all the other stuff should be fine, but it's all interconnected. So when we poison one part, when we damage one part, it trickles down into those other, um, those other, parts of the food web and the ecosystem. And if you look here at these, these ample animals, which is just a very small sampling of what we might find in our backyard, a lot of these animals, like the bird, the spider, the bat, the ladybug, the praying mantis, and the lizard, oh, and the toad, they eat insects. They eat those bugs that you're trying to kill. If we were to allow these animals to have their um, to thrive, to have the, the food that they need, healthy, clean, organic food, just like we all want to eat, then they would be able to do their job a lot better. I was sitting in my yard a few days ago and just kind of watching, watching the clouds pass by. And um, I noticed there was some activity in one of my, my vegetable plants. I was like, what's going on? And I'd been having a caterpillar problem. I don't know if you all vegetable garden but um, caterpillars eat cucumber plants. They love them and it's a huge problem. So I was like, what's going on over there? So I went over there and there was a bird hopping around eating caterpillars in my cucumber plant. I was so excited. I'm glad I didn't spray neem oil or any of the chemicals on there that I could have sprayed because that bird then would have gotten a toxic lunch. And uh, well, maybe not neem oil so much, but some of the other stuff that people commonly use on their vegetable plants or their landscape plants would have made that caterpillar not a very healthy meal for the bird. So if we just allow these things to um, be able to do their job, then we'll all be able to see more birds, see more butterflies, and help restore that natural balance. So here we have some birds. One bird is a cardinal feeding her babies, and the other bird is an owl. Cardinals eat a variety of food, as most birds do. They eat different foods throughout their life cycle. And a big part of what they need to feed their, their babies is caterpillars. They need that soft food so they can smush it down, their babies, um, down into their baby's mouths. But as they get older, they need seeds, and they need um, berries, and they need different foods to eat. And um, a lot of you might have bird feeders. And what are you putting in those bird feeders? Seeds. And you're buying them and you're taking them home in plastic bags. That's great because um, you want to see the birds. But at the same time, you're attracting birds. And many people are actually then spraying their natural food with chemicals. So you're attracting the birds or you're attracting the butterflies with your butterfly garden and your flowers, but you're spraying them. And that's, that's really damaging to the ecosystem. And um, that little owl there, he is, a, he is a carnivore. He eats 
what we definitely don't want, rats and mice in particular, and other small, small animals. So um, when we put poisons out for the, the rodents, we're actually, well, we're getting, maybe getting rid of the rodents, but we're hurting our larger predator animals who will naturally be able to keep that, that ecosystem in balance by just hunting. I have a family of these little owls in my, in my yard, and I really like to watch them sit on the fence at night or hop around in the trees. They're, um, it's really a treat to be able to see them. And that one picture with the red circle, I want to point that out. This is um, a plant that I'm sure some of you have this awful, awful opinion about, the Spanish needle, Biden's Elba. <laughs> it's one of my uh, favorite and absolutely favorite plants at the same time. Um, this plant is, according to many people, the third most important source for nectar for bees in the wintertime. And then if you see the part that I circle, those are seeds. And you're all familiar with those on your shoes or your pant legs, I'm sure. But those are also a big, huge food source for birds. I was reading an article recently, and they said that those seeds um, were a favorite of the painted bunting. So I have never seen a painted bunting here. I think their range is a little bit further north. But they're, if you're not familiar with them, they're a rainbow-colored bird. And they love those. And then also grass seeds. If you want to let your grass get just a little bit long so the, those long stalks come up, or if you have any native grasses in your landscape, birds eat those seeds. Those are the seeds that they naturally eat in nature. There's a number of really beautiful landscape plants that you can have in your yard too, just like that native beauty berry there with the clusters of purple flowers. The birds go crazy for that and just providing the natural food sources in your yard um, will really help your, um, your natural ecosystem to thrive. So just something to keep in mind, you want to reduce your chemical use, plant foods for your birds, and you wanna protect your predator species because they are gonna help restore that balance. Today we're mostly talking about birds and butterflies, but I want to point out that if you have thriving populations of birds and butterflies, you're also going to have thriving populations of lizards and amphibians and bees and all sorts of different, different animals in your yard that will help to eat those pest bugs, the mosquitoes, the, the aphids on your plants. Um, anything that you might want to, to look to spray. There's usually a natural predator for most things. And if we just let nature take its course and provide it the opportunity, there's a much greater chance that it will be able to take care of itself with less or with minimal help. And I did wanna point out while we're um, here that there are several species of native bees in Florida, and the majority of them are actually ground dwellers, meaning they burrow into the ground, they dig holes, and they live in those. So when we put chemicals on our grass, we're killing that native bee population. So yes, we do have honeybees, but honeybees are actually um, considered to be livestock because that's an animal that you purchase and take care of. So, um, we really want to help our native bees to, to be as productive and thrive as much as possible. Another thing that you can do besides pro providing food is you can provide shelter, spaces for those um, animals to hide. Um, one thing that you can do is make a brush pile. And that top image there, that's just a little tiny brush pile that I've made in my yard with some branches that have fallen off my oak tree. I Googled make a brush pile for um, an animal kind of shelter sanctuary. And a lot of them are really big. And I personally didn't really want a really big brush pile in my yard. I didn't, I live in the city. I didn't want to do that. But this, even this small brush pile will make an impact. There are usually toads around in this area and um, different um, animals that I've seen just hopping around. They're able to hide in there. They're able to um, seek shelter if there is an animal up uh, overhead that might want to catch them. And it just provides a little bit more cover. 
Another thing that you can do is plant plants that are multiple heights together. When you look at a forest, you don't see a hedge. You don't see just one simple manicured hedge. You don't see just a stand of trees that are all the same kind. You see different types of plants intermingled at different levels. And what this does is it allows your birds and your animals to have different little branches and different levels to hop between so that they feel safer. They can take cover easily and different animals like different, um, different levels and different areas to nest in, to sit in, to hide in. And the more spaces that you can provide, the more diversity you'll get in your yard. Another thing that you could do is planting in clusters. It's going to look better. It's going to give you that lush botanical gardens look that we all crave. Um, and it's going to give those animals some cover. And um, there's nothing wrong with planting a hedge. I have a hedge in my yard, but you need more than just a simple single layer hedge. Um, one thing that I like to do in my yard is I like to have a small wild area where I can let those plants grow, the grass grow a little bit longer, and I can let the, the Spanish needle grow a little bit um, so that I can attract those animals with the, the wild native, um, I guess, weeds. A lot of them are, are a lot of them are, are considered weeds, but most weeds are actually native plants, and if you let them flower, did anybody here participate in No Mo May? I did. <laughs> Maybe it was No Mo April too. I don't have a whole lot of grass. Um, but anyway, I was just I was always surprised at how many different little flowers came up when I don't mow. Just watching the whatever is green and you mow it, you know, those are usually flowering. Um, and then. If you are one to provide water, like a bird bath for wildlife, consider putting it near a, um, an area where there's cover, also a bird feeder. Um, I was in a class recently and they, they called the bird feeder and the bird bath out in the middle a cat trap or something like that. Anyway, um, it, they meant that the, the birds were out in the open, they were exposed. So if they went to visit that bird feeder or that bird bath, they would be open to predators. So they would either not visit as often or they wouldn't be safe if they did, whether it was a cat or it was a, um, a hawk or something that might want to um, get them. So, So offering them the shelter. But at the same time, you want to be careful so that we don't attract unwanted pests. I know that I try everything possible to avoid rats in my vegetable garden and my compost, um, which is important because we don't want to create a problem. We want to, to solve problems with, with, um, with our landscape maintenance, not create them. So if you build a brush pile, big or small, keep it away from your compost and away from your garden at least three to six feet. That means that you're going to not have an, um, a, a brush pile right up against your garden. They're already going to, the rats or whatever, they're already going to want to seek shelter in whatever you've made. But when you give them a whole bunch of pathways that where there's a lot of shelter, they're much more likely to, um, to visit. If you have fruit trees, keep that fruit picked up. It's really important to keep your fruit picked up not only to prevent um, rodents or pests, but also to keep your yard looking nice. It's important, in my opinion, for those of us who have food forests or um, are growing a lot of uh, edible plants in our yard to be stewards and set good examples for our neighbors for how growing food in the city can be beautiful and wonderful because a lot of people actually think that it, you shouldn't grow food in the city because it will attract pests. So doing everything that we can to eliminate or reduce that is important. And then the healthier you can keep your soil, the fewer insect pests that are going to attract your plants. And then remember, we'll get to this more in detail later, right plant, right place. And then if you're growing annuals, whether it's flowers or vegetables, right season. 
for those annual vegetables. If you're planting during the right time of year, the right weather, those vegetables will have way fewer pest issues. So, how many of you all here compost? If you don't, you should. You can compost your food scraps, your plant-based food scraps, or you, um, and or you can compost your yard waste. Uh, ideally, you would want a mix of the two, browns and greens. I actually have a free composting webinar on Thursday afternoon on Lunch and Learn with the City of Dunedin. So if you don't know how to compost and you're interested, um, go on my website and you can um, sign up. So anyway, just compost should not smell bad. It shouldn't attract pests if you're doing it right. And it's really, really good for your soil and it helps, it helps improve your soil and it prevents runoff and erosion of water, it helps water go down into your soil better, and um, helps your plants to grow deeper, longer, healthier root systems. And then um, you'll actually reduce your waste. Up to 30% of household waste is compostable. So you can take your trash out less and it won't smell as bad. So I don't know if you remembered from that beginning graphic that we showed you with all that life below the soil. This is just that in a different form there is actually more, there are actually more different types of microorganisms in the soil in one spoonful of really good, rich, healthy soil than there are all humans on the planet. That's a lot. Um, in my soil ecology class that I'm taking, the lesson a couple days ago was that there should be 75,000 species of fungus in, um, in a soil sample from a, from a farm. That's, that's a lot, 75,000 species. Not just individuals, but different types. So there's also this food, food system, this, this nutrient system and um, food web below the soil and all these different animals work together from the ground up to keep your plants happy and healthy. So the better that you can maintain your soil by keeping it covered with mulch or keeping it covered with dense plantings and making sure that you're choosing plants wisely and reducing or even eliminating your chemical use, the healthier your soil can be. And then compost is super good for the planet. It helps with the biodiversity of your yard, with your neighborhood, with your community from the ground up. And just like a house, you want a really firm foundation, a really so strong, solid foundation for your plants. Because if you're starting out with poor soil, no matter how many chemicals you put on there, they're never going to be healthy. No matter how much fertilizer you add, your plants are always going to struggle a little bit. And they're going to be dependent upon those chemicals. Compost supports all of those microorganisms, but there are also some larger organisms. And um, the birds absolutely love them. And so do the lizards and the toads and the frogs. And not only do they eat things from your compost or from your soil, they also eat mosquitoes and um, June bugs and other flying insects that might, you might consider to be a pest. And then um, when you make compost, it's just, it's really great for the planet all around. It reduces climate change, it supports our um, ecosystem, we've had a really big problem with red tide here in the past, and it's linked to nutrient um, runoff from fertilizers. So the more that we can do, every little bit helps to reduce our landscape dependency on those, um, those chemicals that will help. Awesome, thank you, Amanda. Um, oopsie. Okay, sorry about that. I think we're unmuted now. Um, I was saying thank you, Amanda, and that sounds like so many amazing things that we could do um, in our yards to attract wildlife. Um, what I'm going to share today is a little bit about butterfly gardening. Um, this is a way that a lot of people like to begin attracting wildlife into their yard. And butterflies are just something that I would say is probably one of the easier things to, to lure into your yard. Uh, you can start really small 
and build up from there. Um, they bring in not only butterflies, but a diversity of pollinators. That's one of the things that people ask us a bit about at Wise Hands um, because we do install a number of butterfly gardens and help maintain them. They'll say, I want to attract the butterflies, but not so much the bees. And it's not really um, possible to do that because they all love the flowers that are going to bring in butterflies, but you don't really need to worry about the bees because if they're going around to different flowers, they're usually pretty content and they don't want to get in your way. Um, another benefit of having a butterfly garden is if you are doing fruit trees or vegetables, um, you're going to have better pollination because you'll have a diversity of pollinators. Like Amanda was saying, those native bees are really good pollinators for your fruits and veggies. You'll have increased uh, biodiversity in your yard. And one way that I like to think about butterflies is a collection. And I'm going to get a little bit more into this in a second, but um, suffice it to say for now that if you have a diversity of plants, you're going to see a lot of different types of butterflies coming. So we can go to the next one. And this might be a review for a lot of people, but it's so fascinating and we just wanted to hone in on the life cycle of the butterfly for what we're going to talk about next. We start, we start anywhere on the wheel, but I'll start with number one, the egg. So butterflies go around your garden and lay eggs on what we will call the host plant. Um, then, of course, the eggs hatch, turn into little caterpillars. Uh, another question that we frequently get is, oh, should I kill all these caterpillars on my plant? And especially if you're gardening for wildlife, we say, no, 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 don't, don't kill all the, the caterpillars that you see because that's your baby butterflies many times. Uh, not always, but many times. And so then they, the larva will munch, munch, munch and eat. Um, and then when they're ready, they'll turn into a cocoon. They'll be in that cocoon for differing amounts of time, depending on the butterfly. And then, of course, metamorphosis occurs and they will emerge a beautiful butterfly. So with that said, let's look at some different plants that you can plant in your garden to, like I said before, collect different butterflies. And one of the things that I was excited about in this web webinar that Amanda shared was it's one thing to have different animals visit your yard. And it's another level, if you will, to have animals and wildlife take up residence in your yard. And it's really cool to have them take up residence in your yard because then you get to see so many different stages of life. Um, so different butterflies use different plants as the food for their young. And usually what they'll do is they'll lay their eggs on their host plant. So then when their eggs hatch, they're right there ready to eat the flowers or the plants, leaves, stems um, that that particular butterfly uses when it, when it grows up. Um, so in this picture, these are both pictures from our garden at home. On the left side, you'll see a giant swallowtail. Their host plant is a variety of citrus. And this is actually a cultivated lemon tree. And this butterfly is actually laying eggs in this picture. It was a really cool, cool one to capture. And then on the right hand side, these are not the same butterfly. This is actually the black swallowtail larva. And what they're eating is a fennel um, flower. And as you can see, they've completely eaten all the the flower off and there's just the stems left and they're still just munching away. Uh, other great host plants are passion vine for your fritillaries and zebra longwings. Um, and then of course milkweeds for the monarch butterflies. That's probably the most well-known one. So if you're considering starting off with a butterfly garden to bring wildlife into your, into your yard, I would even think about, you know, do a little bit of re further research on what types of host plants you can plant to attract different types of butterflies. So you can think about what the visual effect will be in your yard when you design your butterfly garden. And you can also think about the functionality of the plants and what, what is it going to bring into your butterfly garden. 
And then lastly, another thing that will be uh, an attractor of butterflies is giving them water, especially uh, we recently got some rain finally here in Gulfport. Um, but we had a really long dry spell, I think throughout probably Pinellas County. So providing a little bit of water um, will also bring butterflies around. And this is a picture of two different butterfly waters. Um, bird baths are great, but they tend to be too deep for butterflies and, and other insects and they can fall in there and, and drown or it's just not their preferred source of water. So something shallow in the picture on the left, you can see they use what looks like a, a drainage uh, tray for a plant and they fill it with some small pebbles and sand and a little bit of water. So the butterfly can safely land on the rocks and sip the water and, and have a great source. The one on the right looks like it was made, I just found that one online, it was made for butterfly watering. So it's just a small, small area to put some water in for the butterfly to safely sit for a drink. And I think next, I'm going to turn it over to Stefan for more of a um, broad overview of different types of ecosystems you might have in your yard and how to look at the big picture. Uh, <laughs> hey guys, um, so thank you. And I saw uh, that uh, Virginia Overstreet is here in the in the group. Say what's up, Virginia? No. But uh, <laughs> uh, she um, was actually at the picture at the beginning. That was Archbold Biological Research Station, which I uh, recommend everybody getting to. And that's that's where I saw our last uh, part of the Board of Native Plant Society. Um, definitely got to give a shout out to them. Uh, but so. I, being a background as um, you know, a production manager at a retail nursery, I heard everything, every single question, every kind of person who came in. Uh, we sold everything from exotic plants, Florida friendly exotic plants, to fruit trees, to uh, you know, our, our bread and butter. What we really concentrated on was native plants. So I heard all the questions. So I guess I just want to try to give a, a quick overview. I don't know where everybody is as far as their um, experience from you know, novice to um, butterfly obsessed. Uh, you'll know you're butterfly obsessed when you start calling them my butterflies or my caterpillars. Uh, like you, so they're, they're yours. My caterpillars are hungry. I need their plants. Why don't you have them here? They're gonna starve. Help me. <laughs> so when you get to that point, you know you're in a good, good spot. But um, biggest thing is starting with healthy plants. That's gonna start at a good nursery. Um, I, of course, I have to say Wilcox Nursery and Landscape is the best. I, I love everything they've been doing, but um, Sweet Bay Nursery down in Manatee County is great. Um, and other than that, just look on uh, FANN, FAN. the Florida Association of Native Nurseries is going to have a great um, resource for different native nurseries across the state of Florida. There's so many people doing some wonderful stuff. Um, but generally, you're not going to find the best plants at some of the larger box stores. Um, those are not going to be the healthiest plants for specifically butterflies, they do other great things, but uh, not specifically plants. Go to a plant store for plants. Uh, if you want a, a grill or some bricks, you know, go to a home improvement store, but um, there's still good things there. Um, but generally native plants are gonna be at a native plant nursery. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, so observe your landscape. I think that's, that's the simplest thing. Just step back and look at it. Um, be realistic, you know, if you have a very, and we'll go into that some more, but if you have a dry space, let it be a dry space. If you have a moister, shadier area with a large oak tree, then that's a moist, shady area with a large oak tree. You know, you can't um, fight what you have there. Um, and that's part of that observing. Um, when I say soil type, you can get really in depth into soil science. We're not gonna do that. There's hundreds of names for different types of soils. Um, uh, to impress your friends, tell them that Florida state soil is called Mayaca fine sand. Um, which is essentially that. It's a tiny little layer of nothing nutrients on the top and mostly sand, and that's good Florida soil. Um, it's always fun to have somebody come in from somewhere like Iowa or upstate New York or, you know, Michigan, like Amanda was saying, they have um, lots of topsoil, you know, deep, dark, thick soil, whereas down here in Florida, where a geologically younger, we have a very thin layer, but that's great. I say, oh, you got sand, wonderful. Um, we we're gonna go over and, and a simple way to step back and look at your overstory, understory, and your ground, ground layer, ground cover. Um, overstory being trees, you know, what's, what's big, maybe you don't have any trees. 
maybe the biggest thing on your lot is your house. Um, uh, so you can use that. That still has shade. That will cast shade for you. Um, understory is going to be, let's say your shrubs and small trees. Um, that's the next level you're going to look at. Um, uh, hedges, things like that. You can A hedge can be a very um, attractive to wildlife if done in the right way. A diverse hedge does not have to be all the same plant. There's no rule out there that says you have to plant all the same thing. Um, and then your ground layer ground cover. So that grain, ground layer, I would say, would be anything to your small shrubs, small wildflowers. Um, your ground cover is, which is something that we, we've been really enjoying using, your ground cover layer can be an re eventual replacement for mulch. You know, you have to, I think it's important to mulch in the beginning, but I, I would start looking at it more as like a temporary thing. You don't have to re-mulch all the time if you have the plant there that you want. Um, as your ground cover layer, that 20 bags a year could turn into two bags a year. Um, I say take a walk because, you know, uh, in the city of uh, Gulfport, we've had a lot of fun walking around the neighborhood and looking at what everybody else is growing. Um, and as landscapers and landscape designers and, you know, people that have dealt with us for a long time, we spent a lot of time uh, criticizing, but also looking at what people are doing successfully and what's growing well in our area. Um, and when you get to know plants, you can say, okay, that will grow in our area. You know, you, it's, it's that simple, you know, take a walk around and see what you have. Um, and then start to identify. I mean, I'm obsessed with being able to identify plants. Um, in my spare time, I do read books about, it's literally called Weeds of Florida. It's one of my favorite books. It's a riveting, riveting tale. I love it. <laughs> Um, but I love to be able to identify those things, um, not only because it helps our business, but um, because it allows me to really say, okay, is that something that I need to spend time pulling out? Or can I step back and really appreciate that for the intrins intrinsic value that it's bringing to the landscape? Like Amanda was saying, you know, these are incredible plants that have, I mean, you look at just for example, Biden's, you know, it's, it's a tough plant. It's a really tough plant, which is great. It doesn't need any water. It doesn't need any care. It doesn't need anything at all. Uh, it'll it'll grow in, in so many different environments, and that's something to be um, impressed by to see how something can work work so well. So um, be realistic. You know, be realistic about what you really want to do. You know, some people will have very large, grand visions. Start small. Start um, uh, with a little bit less. But if you want to start bigger, you know, I would say definitely getting professional help, um, you know, having somebody help you to do a design or a consultation could save you potentially years of headaches by just trying to, oh, I planted it, it looked cool, but now my entire yard is that plant. And I renamed my house Pothos Alley because it was a nice house plant and I put it in my house and now it got taken over. So that's why if you do want to do something bigger, I would definitely recommend doing the research or hiring some professional help. You can also start out smaller and still have some help. Um, and then change your expectations, you know, be, again, being realistic, like what, what your, what your expectations should be, should be based in reality. Um, and then uh, stress as an asset is one of my favorite things. Uh, if you have a dry, sandy, caked yard, salty, then that's awesome. You have an amazing, unique environment that you can grow plants in that no one else can. Somebody who has a moist, not salty, you know, different area, different zone, you know, use that, that stress, what could be a, a challenge um, as an asset. Um, can we go to the next slide, Amanda? Um, so I'm just going to try to go over a uh, um, quick, and I, I don't know if we mentioned in the beginning, but um, we definitely want to have plenty of time to take everybody's questions. Um, that's always a lot of fun um, to see what, what people are really here for and what they want to hear. You know, a lot of these things, people here might have might have already heard but um you know uh, we'll try to uh take as many questions as we can but um so your beachy coastal area you know we have tons of intracoastal areas we also have what would have been former sand hill environments and that would be literally a high area of sand so if you have a type of yard where you can get a rain like we got on saturday and the water is gone instantly these are the types of plants that you could also use as well, um, but it's going to also flow over into a, a pine, um, pine flatwood type of environment. Um, but uh, so beachy coastal area, if you are 
beach, coastal. Um, you got a lot of stuff that's going to like the full sun. There's not a lot of um, large shade casting trees on a beach or a coastal area. Australian pines do not count invasive tree. <laughs> um, and that's a whole other subject in and of itself. Invasive plants is important to know. Um, you know, well-drained soil, the water goes away right away. That's well-drained. Excessively well-drained is actually what you could call it as well. Um, low nutrients. These plants do not need any kind of special miracle grow soil. They don't need a fertilizer. They don't need worm castings. Like, I, I, I think it's great, but, you know, a lot of people come in, especially when they're planting a tree, it, oh, I bought 20 bags of miracle grow X500 soil. It's amazing. And I put in like five pounds of fertilizer and worm castings and I planted my pine tree. I'm like, why would you, why would you do that? You know, you're, you're truly handicapping your tree if you're not planting to uh, the area that's in there. And that's one of the biggest things with trees is you don't need to mend your soil. But if you have a beachy coastal area, uh, plant beach coastal plants. Um, and yeah, just to clarify this, what Seth's been going over with these different archetypes isn't what you want, it's what you already have. So look at, you know, what kinds of trees, what kinds of soil you have. And, and I think one of the reasons we wanted to, and Amanda asked us to go through these different types of ecosystems is because with planting the plants that will be happy in that ecosystem, you'll also attract the types of wildlife that live in those ecosystems as well. Exactly. So make that. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. No, thank you, Molly, for, for kind of giving that, that background. Yeah, this is what you already have. And then planting these mm -hmm. native plants to this environment are going to be giving back that habitat that was always there. You know, it's just, it's so incredible. If you plant it, they will come. It's that simple. You know, if there yeah. used to be buttonwoods and cabbage palms and gumbo limbos and pines, and all these other flowers and grasses there, and you put them back, those endemic, and you know, when we say endemic, that means it doesn't occur anywhere else in the world. It's endemic to Florida. Those endemic species uh, will, will return and will have an area that they can actually nest and live and procreate and have that, have your yard as its, as its habitat. So, um, yeah, so these are just some, you know, I, I won't go through all of these, but, um, Beachy coastal type plants, um, buttonwood is one of my favorite. Um, you know, you have, of course, all your um, cabbage palms, which is probably one of the toughest plants around. If you have any issues with exotic palms, you won't have them with cabbage palms. They don't need anything extra. Um, uh, and then a lot of different cool things. Gumbo limbos are super cool. Um, pines, you know, I say pines, they're not right on the beach, but further back the pine flatwood area would actually um, uh, flow over into a beachy coastal type of area. Um, and then, of course, mangroves are incredible. And then a lot of different awesome flowers that you can put in. Dune sunflower is what you see the picture of here. And there, there's a lot of others. Uh, and I would say just take a walk on the beach and see what you, uh, see what you can see. All right, so pine flatwoods, uh, Pine Ellis County is named after pines. Um, most of the southeast, um, more than 90% was covered in longleaf pine habitat. Um, we have lost some species to extinction because of uh, all the removal of the longleaf pines. Um, over 95%, if not more of them, have been developed. Um, uh, but an uh, important thing to know about this is it's uh, dominated by pines. You know, plant pines in your tree, uh, in, your, uh, in your yard. You know, they're amazing plants. And they attract so many different types of types of animals, um, and they attract a diverse understory, like we were talking about. Uh, you have a lot of different types of pine flatwoods, ranging from very sandy to um, a little less well drained. You know, areas staying a little bit more moist. Um, so it's a very large um, diversity of um, of plants that you can attract, uh, that you can put in that area that will attract a lot of different types of uh, types of creatures. One of our favorites that we deal with is uh, gopher tortoises. Um, we're lucky enough to be able to work at um, some properties where there's still enough space for gopher tortoises to live and thrive and breed. And, breed. and mostly what they eat is, uh, is grass, actually. Um, so um, yeah, when you look at something that's fire adapted, 
it likes to have some open space in between it, you know, sandiness, um, your wire grasses, uh, saw palmetto is amazing, super tough plants. Um, and then in a moister area of the pine flatwoods, that's where you would find your blazing star, coreopsis, and milkweeds. And coreopsis is the state uh, wildflower of Florida. Um, so that's what most of Pinellas was. So if you're anywhere away from the coast, um, you probably have some type of pine flatwoods type of environment. So look into that to find out what you can put in your yard to attract a lot of different things. All right, everybody, we have um, a couple people who are raising their hands and um, we really want to take your questions, but we don't have a way to communicate you if you with you if you raise your hand. If you want to type your questions into either the Q&A in the box or the chat box, we'll be able to see them. So thank you, all right. And thanks for the questions, guys. We really wanna to try to get to everything. And I'm always excited with these things because we always learn something new. You know, we have a passion for this, like Amanda was saying, and, and um, this is what we're kind of obsessed with, but there's always something new to learn. Um, so I always try to, try to stay humble with all of this stuff and I'm sure we can learn some stuff from you guys. So um, the other type of area I wanted to talk about is kind of what, I don't know if you noticed on the last slide, I did say that pine flatwoods and pine trees are fire adapted. So fire is super important in Florida. Once you start getting involved with the native plant society and native plants in general and, and the historical habitats that were in Florida, you'll understand the role that fire plays. Some places would have burned every year, two years, three years. Other places would have burned maybe every 20 or 30 years, but fire was um, and still is in a lot of places an important aspect. When you take that fire away like we have, obviously you don't have um, you know, healthy fires in Pinellas County anymore because there's no space, it's developed. So what happened is oaks have kind of become the dominant, uh, dominant plant and that oak will turn it into an oak hammock and an oak hammock is pretty much a slightly raised area of soil you know Florida um, elevation is measured in inches so it's slightly raised oak trees kind of take over and create their own habitat the oak tree being the dominant um, plant in Pinellas County um, last time I checked is about 70 percent plus of Pinellas County is actually live in laurel oak um, so what can you plant if you got a huge oak tree? And oak trees are amazing. Oak trees themselves can uh, support over, last time I checked, 300 different types of insects. A lot of those being fat, juicy, delicious grubs and worms, like Amanda was saying, which are super important for young, uh, uh, young birds, um, but also different types of small mammals, um, our possums, things like that, uh, which I think possums are very cute, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, we'll eat eat things like that, and it's an it's important uh, food source for them. But obviously, your your birds, different things like that. So an oak is a great thing to have. So after you have that oak, um, you're gonna have uh, a little bit more moisture retention in your yard, especially with a live oak, um, and with all that um, leaf matter that's dropping. Uh, so after a while, it actually will improve the soil and change that soil. So you're gonna have more moisture and heavy shade, and that's where different things like what we're seeing. Um, still different types of grasses you can use. Um, beauty berry, shiny coffee is one of my favorites. Those are your shrubs. Uh, a wild petunia, I don't have that on there. We do have a native petunia. Um, and I added native azaleas because I got a native azalea from North Florida because I wanted one. And everyone told me you can't grow it here, but I brought it anyway. And we brought it to our very dry yard and it was suffering where I put it. Even though I put it in heavy shade, it was not happy with the soil. So what we did was we collected about 20 bags of oak leaves. From this yard you're seeing on the screen. From this yard that you're seeing on the screen, which is in um, South Tampa. Um, and we're like, we're not throwing away this, this leaf gold. We're, this is amazing. This is coming back to our place. So we just took these huge bags of leaves and we dumped them right on the azalea and I haven't had to water it since. And that was about two weeks ago. So it needed that um, acidity from the leaves, um, also the moisture, the moisture retention. And as that breaks down, that's where all those awesome little critters that Amanda was pointing out, that's where they live in between. You know, imagine 
a, stack, like a 10 inch stack of leaves breaking down over time, that's like the coolest insect playground. It's like a, a jungle gym times a million, you know, it's just like this intricate okay. web and a buffet. I mean, so it's, it's pretty incredible. So, um, and then I added things like magnolia, sweet gum, red maple, elms, and that's what we're seeing a lot are our, our, uh, our tree canopy. Um, you'll see a lot of those things um, along with, with your live oaks. But uh, um, yeah, a lot of that has come in because the pines um, are, were taken out, uh, but I see people planting pines now in very dry areas. People have spent a lot of time removing laurel oaks. Uh, if you've heard of laurel oaks, they do have a very short lifespan. And that's why I say, get a good arborist. You want to have a ISA certified arborist at the least. And also being from a reputable company, um, uh, O'Neill's is great, UT is great. Um, I'm sure Amanda knows some up in Dunedin area as well. Uh, but having a good arborist to take care of your trees, I mean, live oak, they call it that because it could live for, live for hundreds of years, so. Um, oh, so yeah, we're talking about, um, uh, blueberries um, in the flatwoods. Uh, so the cool thing about blueberries is the the variety that you get in the store is actually a um, a uh, cultivar of our native of a native blueberry called the high bush blueberry. Um, and the high bush blueberry will grow in this area of Florida up into North Florida. As far as what South Florida, I'm not 100 percent sure. Up further south from here, but it will grow um, in North Florida and in Central Florida. We have some growing out in our pine flatwoods scrub area that we are working on. Um, scrub blueberry is a variety, um, high bush blueberry, shiny blueberry. There's a ton of different blueberry species actually. The vicinians, anything in the vicinium family is, is going to be a blueberry. So you can definitely grow those. Um, uh, yeah, and there's tons of blueberry farms here. Yeah, they do grow great in Florida. Um, yeah, and it shares many plants uh, with flatwoods. So yeah, so that's kind of the, the oak hammock. Um, and I say scrubby flatwoods. I didn't, I didn't mention that as much. So scrubby flatwoods is, you'll probably see um, some oak areas that the oak tree is, seems a little bit squatter. You're probably looking at a sand live oak and it's an oak tree that grows in extremely dry areas, but there's no pines there. So that would also be your things like myrtle oaks, scrub oaks, sand live oaks. Um, they're super hardy, tough plants, and they're they're incredible with the amount of uh, um, uh, a variety of uh, things that they attract as well. So, yeah, I like plants. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that's that's kind of. What we wanted to go over, but real quick, what we do, um, I don't know if we mentioned in the beginning, and I've been talking to Mile a minute, so I'll let um, Mallory explain, because she does, um, she does most of the um, design work. We all do everything together, but um, really what it started with was maintenance, uh, because you need a special wise hand to maintain your landscape, uh, because uh, there was just a lot of people that had, um, landscapes and there wasn't as many uh, people doing that type of maintenance so that's really where it started but we love butterfly gardens pollinator plants and mm -hmm. things like that uh, but Mallory can maybe explain some of the other things you do yeah um, we have a nice little handy list um, here on the screen so um, like Stefan has said we can come out and help you identify some plants if you are going through your yard and maybe you just moved or you haven't had them identified before if you're not sure where to start or what kind of ecosystem um, that, your, that your yard is. We do help with identification um, and consultation. We can help educate you about the plants that are in your yard. Um, we do have background in permaculture design as well. Um, but like Stefan said, the majority of what we do is maintenance. So if you you know, maybe you only live here part of the year or you just need some help with keeping the weeds that you don't want in your yard out. Like for us, I mean, I think the biggest trouble we have is with the grasses. Um, that's what we do and we know, you know, for the most part, we're pretty good with what seedlings of plants we want look like. So if you're trying to cultivate something like a meadow or a lush butterfly garden, we can recognize those seedlings, show you them and 
and keep them growing in nice and thick um, throughout the year. So I think that pretty much covers what we do. Yeah. yeah. If you work with Amanda and get a beautiful design done, we can also plant it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely refer um, most of my installations over to uh, Mallory and Steph, and they do a great job. Um, I do native plant work, and I also do, um, I do edible work as well. I, um, I design gardens, food forests, permaculture projects, and um, native plants, or um, a combination of all three, kind of put them together. Um, I also do virtual consultations, so if you're not local and you want something simple or you just need some um, ideas, I do virtual consultations, video consultations. Um, I do garden refresh for um, North Pinellas County, so if you need someone to come in and weed your garden and replant it with some vegetable seedlings for the, the appropriate growing season, I can do that for you. Um, landscape design and... Um, I also develop a DIY plan for people who want to do it themselves and you can have help with some of it or part of it or whatever and um, do a good part of it yourself as well. I also do garden coaching and a lot of gardening classes and compost system design and support. So if you need help with any of that stuff, reach out. And here's our, our contact information. And while this is up, we're going to take your questions. We had quite a few come in. Um, I'll take this one. Do either of us work in um, Hillsborough County? Yes. Yes, I will go to Hillsborough County and, um, and we also do. So yeah, it's a yes for us too. All right. So in the, in the Q and A here, we have, I had a black swallowtail caterpillar last week on my parsley plant. I brought the plant inside on my lanai um with the caterpillar but it disappeared after four days i can't find it anywhere well um mallory do you want to take this one my best guess is it crawled up around somewhere private to cocoon because they'll go into to hidden places to cocoon what do you think yeah yeah we we found butterflies cocooning and larvae and all that and all kinds of strange places. For some reason on the undersides of doors, railings, <laughs> on other plants, it's hiding. <laughs> I found one one time on a garden statue on the nose of a mermaid hanging off. <laughs> 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 um, it could have also left though because it didn't have enough food. Um, butterflies often and caterpillars often don't like to be taken indoors. That that might be something they didn't like. Are there ways to get water to the butterflies without encouraging mosquitoes to breed? Um, I read that you should refresh your butterfly waters, you know, every other day or so, just you know, filling it up with the hose and letting that old water come out. I think there's some kind of tablets that you can use as well, but I don't know if they're safe for butterflies. Well, I've seen also people will fill up like a, a very shallow dish with sand. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of just like wet sand. It's not standing water. Because mosquitoes do need standing water to breed only a tiny amount. Uh, so if you had your dish low enough so that it will spill over and you put enough sand in it, um, ostensibly you wouldn't have enough room for a mosquito to actually breed in it because they do need uh, standing water for the little larva to, to kind of hang out. The the puddlers, the little trays that you make the butterfly watering dish out of, those are usually pretty shallow anyway, and water evaporates pretty quickly. Yeah, it was so hot today, our bird bath was almost empty. It was very hot today. <laughs> Just like one day of fun. Yeah. What are some things I can do to attract bats? They don't seem to be around my current neighborhood of Harshock Lake. Amanda, you had a picture of bats. What do you think? So um, my neighborhood is actually full of bats. And um, they, the different species of bats, like different nesting spaces, there's a really big bat house at a park near my house. Um, 
near Moccasin Lake Nature Preserve in Clearwater. And it's really tall. It has this big, um, like, it's a big tower. And inside, there's all these little slats. They like um, to, to sleep or nest in these kind of, like, tight, cozy spaces. And one thing that they like is those palm trees with the skirts, you know, the, like, a cabbage palm, a native palm, and then it, ha it has the green fronds on top that it has the fronds on the bottom. Well, people usually remove those. Tree services usually remove those. But in nature, that has a purpose. So I'll, when we take um, our plants that we're supposed to, that we're, we're nurturing and we um, over manicure them, what we're doing is we're depriving the natural systems of their ability to support that ecosystem. So those fronds will naturally kind of prune off, fall off as the, the tree grows. And I understand those, that is unsightly, but that's one thing that you can do to attract bats. You can also get a bat house, but you need to look into making sure that you um, hang it up at the right height, because I know that is something that is kind of particular for different species of bats. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's great advice. There's also a really cool website called tampabaybats.net. And uh, I forgot where it was we had seen them, but uh, it was a festival somewhere. And there's people that do spend their time. Uh, if you find a bat on the ground, uh, call them and they can help you out to rehabilitate them. Um, they do get attacked by different things sometimes or, um, or might fall out because a tree was prematurely pruned. Um, they love that cabbage palm. Uh, the, like Amanda was saying, the, the fronds stacked on one another make a great habitat. Um, and if you look at, I mean, in my opinion, a cabbage palm that's left naturally um, booted, you know, with those pieces attached to the trunk and also the older fronds, which do not ever need to be removed, is much more beautiful than the over pruned, extremely over pruned trees that you'll see a lot of times where it's a tiny little tuft. And one of the biggest no-nos is you never, ever prune green fronds. Um, palms can be very sensitive to that. They need every frond to be able to produce food for themselves through photosynthesis. And if you're cutting off those green fronds, you're putting your palm trees at risk, exotic and native, especially your native. Um, so I think that's, that's great advice is let things be a little more natural. One of, okay, so neem oil. My goal is to grow a food forest that is welcoming to nat natural animals, but some of my veggies are getting wrecked. How harmful is neem oil to birds, bugs, ladybugs? So neem oil doesn't discriminate between what it, um, what it kills. I guess you could say um, you want to apply it at night if you're going to use any of those products because Insects are usually less active as far as like predatory insects go and um, bees and bird, um, birds. So that way it'll have time to dry. But if you're trying to attract ladybugs or that natural ecosystem, you might want to consider not using neem oil. Um, one just really simple thing that you can do if you want to get rid of the bugs is you can um, hit them with a the hose. You can blast them with a stream of water it'll blast them off the plant and then yeah they'll probably get back on the plant but it gives the plant some relief. One of my favorite ways to tackle that problem is to use what I call trap plants where I'll take some my favorite to use is a cow peas or black eyed peas and I'll plant them in poor soil so they'll grow really well but they won't be as healthy as the plants that I planted in my garden soil so that's why I say plant them in poor soil. They're really pretty plants um, so you can put them just, you know, somewhere where you can see them even, it's fine. But they attract aphids like crazy. And why do you want aphids? You want ladybugs. Aphids are ladybugs' favorite food. Mm -hmm. Ladybugs and other predatory insects eat other bugs too, but aphids will come in droves to those cow peas or black-eyed peas. And then you'll have your predatory population start to um, take up residency in your yard. And I also see someone mention that um, bats also nest in Spanish moss. Spanish moss is great. Spanish moss will also be a really good habitat in and of itself. They attract a lot of good things and it's not bad for your tree. You don't need it ever removed from your tree. Just a quick note on that, the bats.
Another question about bird houses. Are there any particular birds in Pinellas that would benefit from a bird house? What shapes or sizes? I want to make one with my grandkids, but I want to make one that will be useful and not just decorative. That one, I believe you have to, I, I think from what I've read, the birds are uh, specific about the size of the hole and the size of the, um, I guess, interior of a birdhouse. So I would look up specific birds that you want to attract to it and build it to those specifications. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there's so many different birds in this area. Most of them are migratory in one way or the other, but I mean, mockingbirds and blue jays and cardinals, mm -hmm. things like that don't necessarily need uh, any kind of birdhouse. You know, they do pretty well on their own, but something more specific. I know people love owl boxes mm -hmm. um, specific to that size, but like Mallory was saying, if it's something that's a small enough hole for a certain type of bird, they'll feel much safer to go in there because mm -hmm. predators won't be able to get in as readily. Um, would you recommend adding food plants like kale or tomatoes and such with milkweed or tropical sage? Yeah, we love mixing uh, our native plants and flowers and veggies. It's beautiful and it helps everything stay healthy. That's awesome. I love doing that. I, I mean, Mallory was kind of the one who, and I said, oh, let's, you know, it doesn't just have to be a wildflower garden. Why not we put some, you know, beautiful ornamental and edible kale in there and a tomato and a broccoli and then around it have yeah tropical sage i mean if you know what tropical sage is it seeds like crazy um but uh it can be grown in more nutrient rich soils that veggie plants would like i, I think it's up to your aesthetic but if it shares a similar type of um cultural requirements as far as light and moisture and and uh, nutrient content in the soil go for it i think that's awesome i, I love that mix Another thing, another benefit that you'll see with mixing vegetable plants and flowering plants or different types of vegetable plants together is you'll have diversity in your plants. And when insects, like pest insects, are looking for food, they're going to see, look for a lot of their food. When you're wanting to plant a butterfly garden or something, it's often recommended to plant several of the same plants together so the butterflies can see them more easily. But it's the same for pest insects. So when you have a whole, you know, big garden full of tomatoes and only tomatoes, the tomato pest insects are like, oh, look at all those tomatoes. This is a giant buffet. But if you have a tomato plant and like six other plants together, they're like, is that a tomato? I'm not sure. Maybe I'll keep looking for something else. So your plants will be probably a little bit more pest resilient in that diverse planted environment. Absolutely. I see uh, Aaron's question about the, the little green parrots that we have here. Um, they're not native, but I've noticed that they really love eating in our yard the Barbados cherries, as well as sunflower seeds. If you grow a big sunflower, they'll come, but they usually come all in one day and eat all of it. <laughs> all the cherries are all the sunflowers. Um, I, so, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Amanda. I have a problem with wasps eating caterpillars. I can't find the wasp nest, but they keep returning often. What can I do to deter them? You know, wasps are pretty much all parasites, which is really cool. If you read more about wasps, they all parasitize something else. And there's actually a bunch of wasps that eat other wasps but also um, birds uh, and different types of uh, um, uh, mammals, birds and different types of insects will eat them. So having a nice diversity of things um, and maybe like Amanda was saying, you know, maybe move your butterfly attracting plants um, in different areas throughout your yard and see where it works. Um, but wasps are just kind of part of the, part of the food chain. Not all your caterpillars, unfortunately, can or should survive you know really having the fittest of them survive is going to be helpful for the species longevity in the long run anyway this may not be a popular answer <laughs> um but there's a lot of controversy around folks who are bringing in mass amounts of butterflies into their home and raising butterflies indoors um there's some research 
and some professionals who feel that is um, causing butterflies and caterpillars who wouldn't have ordinarily survived in the wild because they weren't healthy enough to um, to flourish and then go out and and procreate and causing some um, problems in the the gene pool, I guess you could say. Um, it's encouraging some of those um, some of those um, health problems to um, exist longer than they would have if they would have been taken care of naturally. So yeah, yeah definitely sense. agreed. Um, and going back a couple questions ago, uh, we had uh, um, Aaron and uh, Ron talk about pipe vines. Um, so that's that's something that um, I've I've heard a couple different opinions on. You know, we have a couple native pipe vine um, uh, varieties that we have planted. They're just not very um, showy. Um, but what we do have available is the Dutchman's pipe. That's probably what you're used to seeing. It's the one with the gigantic hanging flower, it's six inches wide, six inches um, long, uh, very unique looking flower. And that will attract the polydamus swallowtail. I have not seen any other varieties of swallowtail use it. Uh, I mean, pipe vines, uh, pipe vine swallowtails use it. Uh, the polydamus swallowtail will use it, not, not the pipe vine that I've seen. Um, so if you want the pipe vine swallowtail, um, there is another Aristolochia species that's the name of the um uh the the pipe vine yeah yeah she says you got the dutchman's pipe um that's aristolochia gigantia because it has a gigantic flower but aristolochia species if you look those up um a-r-i-s-t-o-l-c-h-a -A, aristolochia um is going to be there's going to be different there's different varieties that are available actually at a couple of native nurseries if you want to try to attract different um different types so that was uh, the pipeline question. And um, um, yeah, I do notice just one more from the green palms. Um, uh, Bernadette said, uh, you know, leave the green, uh, green fronds on the tree. Don't cut its leaves off. Um, is it the same with the seed pods? Um, so while the um, seed pod is flowering, especially with the cabbage palm that I've seen, but also with some of the exo other exotic palms as well, you know, queen palm and things like that, you'll see just a massive amount of pollinators on them. They just come and it's just a show. It's so cool, especially uh, if your cabbage palm is maybe still smaller and you can see it. We have one in our yard, luckily, um, and it's about eye level and the bumblebees absolutely love it. Um, so I would say that's enough reason to leave it on. Um, the and berries as well. Exactly. And the berries are going to attract, uh, like Aaron was saying, you know, the um, exotic green parrots, which isn't what I would particularly want to attract to a yard, but they're still cool. Um, and then different types of types of birds are definitely going to use those seeds. We actually had someone tell us they were analyzing uh, coyote scat in Boyd Hill Nature Preserve and that one of the most common things they found that coyotes were eating was the queen palm fruit. So all kinds of things eat that stuff, I guess. Yep. I had a dog that used to eat the queen palm fruit. <laughs> Freaked me right out. I took him to the vet's office. What is this? <laughs> and that's because I'm from Michigan. Um, <laughs> we have another question. Melon worms have taken over so many cucumbers, pumpkins, and killed their plants. Any suggestions? Well, um, that is a fact of life. And one of the reasons why I don't grow those things every year. Um, you can look at the underside of your leaves and try to um, catch them when they're small. And you can also use a product called BT. It is um, OMRI listed. Um, it's, you'll have to dilute it with water. It's a, a bacteria that kills caterpillars and nothing else. You have to be very careful that you don't put it on anything that you want caterpillars on, like a butterfly um, larval host plant. Um, but those caterpillars are pretty, um, they're pretty voracious and they will bore into the stems as well. So just visually checking for the, the, um, the little caterpillars is important. And the wasps, have the wasps come and eat them. Yeah, yeah, wasps will eat them <laughs> and the birds. Um, it's really cool actually at, the, at Wilcox, uh, we have a fence that runs up along um, the edge of the property and we had uh, three huge southern red cedars 
that we we planted there actually about three years ago they're not they're not so gigantic but they're filled with small birds and i decided to i didn't i didn't actually tell my boss until it was covering the fence but i grew some seminal pumpkin which if you've ever grown seminal pumpkin it's a huge vine and i think i still have like 10 pumpkins and like another 20 i'm trying to give away but a ton of fruit from it so First of all, varieties that are good for your area. You, that goes right back to the right plant, right place, healthy plant. Don't try to plant something that's not uh, going to do well here, that you already know is going to fail here. If it's adapted to northern Michigan, then you can talk to Amanda about real estate opportunities in northern Michigan and grow something up there. You know, But now that you're here in steamy, crazy Florida, you have to kind of just change your expectations a little bit about what can grow and also the season. Amanda mentioned that as well. Seasonality of things is super important. I was just going to say two of the seed companies that we really found success with um, are Southern Adapted Seeds. So there's Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and So True Seed, um, neither of which are in Florida, but there's still more uh, varieties that are more well adapted to the heat. And good luck with Southern Exposure. Uh, the point of the Southern Red Cedar is next to the seminal pumpkin vine on the fence was that the southern red cedar was great habitat for the birds and I witnessed it with my own eyes that the bird would hop out on the fence where the vine was growing and spent five, ten minutes picking every single, hand picking for me, of course, every single green caterpillar and worm that was on that seminal pumpkin just picked it clean because they, that's what they want. They love it. But if you have no, if the birds can't get to it, there's no access to it no habitat for them. or no habitat for them, then they're just going to devour your, um, your plants. But cucumbers can be tough. I wouldn't try again until it gets cooler. So we have a, a comment here. I'm from Michigan. Uh, welcome to the hot, sticky South Gale. And I've <laughs> tried um, to have a beautiful flower garden like my mom. My Florida native husband said to give it up. Oh. Well, <laughs> you can have a beautiful garden. You're just going to need to have different plants. Exactly. It's look different, oh, yeah. but you can. Actually, I do know someone that, that grows dahlias here. I think there's a, a southern adapted dahlia. Yeah. Hmm. Get to the native nurseries. There's flowers everywhere. Don't forget that Florida is Spanish for the land of flowers. Flores, this is named after flowers. We got more flowers than anybody. So you just gotta go check out your parks, check out a managed yard, yeah. go to the native nurseries. Uh, you can absolutely grow things here. Soaks after. Yeah, there's so many cool ones. Um, also, Aaron's asking about uh, what you can plant to um, attract uh, cardinals. She has lots of mockingbirds and blue jays. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm really not sure. I've seen all three together. I definitely see cardinals less. Um, I do notice them in areas with a little bit more mature tree canopy, large pine trees, large, um, large oaks especially. Um, um, but, you know, that's a great question. I'm not 100% sure. If you've got the others, then doing what you're doing maybe plant some pine trees <laughs> yes you have to give up having a mission in yard it's not going to happen change your expectations <laughs> i also want to mention um just while we have a second we just got this book bringing nature home which I've heard it's the best, especially from Amanda, so. <laughs> I haven't read it. I've, I've read parts. Yeah, but we're going to. How you can sustain wildlife with native plants. So it's all about what we're talking about tonight. Yeah, I'm very that, excited to read that one The author of that book is Doug Tallamy, and mm -hmm. um, he did a free webinar a few weeks ago that I, um, I sat through and took very detailed notes. I was a little starstruck the whole time. He's one of my um, inspirations, I guess. Uh, and anyway, um, the webinar was recorded, and I will include a link to that in our recording of this um, this webinar, so you can have an opportunity to to look at that if you want to. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of great um, authors out there. Craig Eugle 
local, all about native plants. He has some great books. Uh, and there's a guy also named Walter Kingsley Taylor um, who wrote some amazing wildflower identification books um, is, uh, is a really good one as well. Um, Aaron said, yeah, willow tree. Willow tree nursery is great for exotics, is not good for native plants, but they are still a very awesome nursery. Uh, they have great um, veggie plants there as well, as far as I know. And uh, so there's a lot of really cool, visit local, you know, check out your local nurseries for sure. Um, you know, there, this area used to be covered with, with uh, actually a bunch of different nurseries back in the day, but um, yeah, there's not that many left. So definitely support, support local for sure. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, if you're trying to um, maybe go on a native plant walk or go to a local park and you're using one of those phone apps like um, Picture This, they don't really do a good job of identifying Florida native plants. So um, you could always take pictures and send them to one of us or you can post them on the Florida Native Plant Society um, or Florida Native Plant uh, Facebook page and someone will ID them for you there. Hmm. Um, so um, uh, William said black oil sunflower seeds will attract all the cardinals you want. Um, I personally think bird feeders are, are cool. I think they're, they're an interesting way to, to get birds to come to the yard. But for me, planting native plants and planting their food source that's growing here naturally is, is the way to go. Um, I think it's a cool way to feed things in the in Tarim. Um, and I know people that have both, that have native plants and still the bird feeders. Um, but we don't have any bird feeders in our yard and we have so many birds in the area. Um, but we do have a lot of also fruit trees as well to maybe supplement. Um, so that's, I think uh, we have one called, um, yeah, Barbados cherry is great. And there's enough cherries for us and the birds. Mm -hmm. um, but that's cool. I, I, if you want to see some sooner, you know, try the black oil sunflower seeds, but maybe put a bird feeder up and plant some native shrubs around it as, I mean, what if you can't go to the store and buy black oil sunflower seeds, your cardinals are going to be looking at you pretty pissed like, Hey man, what happened to those black hour sunflower seeds? I got used to it, you know? Um, so maybe having a little bit of both as well. Um, but I think that's, that's cool advice uh, either way and just people enjoying. Uh, so Aaron said squirrels wreck her bird feeders. <laughs> I gave up and just plant. Okay. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Man, have you had problems with squirrels? Yeah. Um, I have a I have a four year old and he he does like a bird feeder. So I don't have one out all the time, but every once in a while we'll buy a bag of bird seed and we'll put up a feeder, and eventually a few birds will go to it. But for the most part, the squirrels get in it and they dump it out somehow. No matter how squirrel proof it is, you know I do all the things, all the gizmos, and they I I just I don't know. I feed I guess I feed the squirrels, um, but very few birds come to it. But I do see a lot of birds in my yard. I have at least three different species that nest in my trees and it's not uncommon to see four or five different types of birds all at the same time while I'm just sitting there having my coffee in the morning. It's really nice. Um, yeah. I don't know how my mother feels about this, but my, my yard is too loud in the morning with the birds to call my mom on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I can't hear the phone. It's too, they're too, they're too noisy. Um, in a good way, they're singing. They're, you know, songbirds, but you can have beautiful also, wildlife in the city. Yeah, for, for those of you just starting out, don't get discouraged because we've been at our place three years, but also built on the foundation that the former owners started, which was a lot of native plants and fruit trees. And I think, Amanda, you've been at your place. Um, I've been at my place for eight years. And when I moved in, there was... Um, there were three large laurel oak trees. So that was, that was also to our advantage and their neighborhood is just full of um, large mature trees. It's an older neighborhood, but um, I've added the, the native plants. It looks um, much fuller now. And I mean, I always had, you know, a few blue jays or a mockingbird here and there, but now I'm seeing birds I have to look up. I'm like, I've never seen that one before. I have to look it up and, and see, what, um, see what kind it is. That's kind of cool. Yeah, so just, you know, start somewhere if, if you're if you're brand new and 
Also, if you notice that there isn't a lot of habitat in your neighborhood, you could be that kind of island for, for things passing through. So great to, to either way, if you have, you know, a neighborhood full of mature trees, or if you're the first one kind of getting it started, that's a great stopping point for a bird or a butterfly on its way somewhere else too. That's a, that's a great takeaway. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that, that the whole idea of this is that your yard can potentially be the surviving link that a creature needs to carry on because there's nothing else for it to eat because it's surrounded by a sea of um, chemicals and over lawned yards. You know, lawn is not bad, but um, it's not attracting anything. There's no habitat in a manicured lawn at all. So you really could be that creature's last chance at actually survival because it has somewhere to actually get some food and cover and shelter and all those things. So. In uh, Doug Tallamy's book, he says that over 80% of the land east of the Mississippi River is privately owned. And when you're considering conservation, if you don't consider privately owned land as a big part of conservation efforts to restore wildlife and habitat, you're missing out on the big, big piece of the pie, not only percentage wise, but also control wise, you likely have control over what plants you put in your yard. Um, but when you're considering public spaces, parks and um, street sides and whatnot, there's a lot of red tape to make any changes, budget issues, there's, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Those changes happen a lot more slowly. And um, a lot of those areas are also um, being taken over by invasives or um, being sprayed with chemicals to remove the invasives, which is removing the habitat, even if it's temporarily for those species. So they may be relying upon the We lost some audio from Amanda. Can you guys still hear us? Amanda, I think I'm back. Yep, you're back. Okay. Sorry cool. about that. I said this wonderful inspirational thing too. Um, <laughs> I saw it in your eyes. We saw the fire in your eyes. I was like, oh my God, we're missing it. Um. Yeah, I was talking about Doug Tallamy. I don't know where I where I left off. Where I left off. Did you hear me talk about that? We, we heard that part and 80% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. So thinking about your own private space, there's a lot of red tape involved with making public space. Um, oh, you guys heard the message. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was the important part. So yeah, just look at some natives. They're really cool. Absolutely. And I think most, you know, if there are people on here that aren't, um, you know, owners of a property, there's so many community gardens in Pinellas County, and I'm sure most of them would be delighted to have an, a bed dedicated to native plants or a hedge that was uh, native flowering shrubs that would bring more butterflies and birds to the community garden. So whatever yeah. space you've got. Yeah, so <laughs> it's something we did actually at a community garden plot for the Florida Native Plant Society Pinellas chapter. We took this plot that no one was using and we put a bunch of native plants in it. Um, and uh, it was a little, a beautiful little space. So we put some signs there. So if you want to grow flowers and you don't feel like growing tomatoes or whatever, you know, you can go to those spaces and say, hey, I'm helping out your tomato plants because I'm attracting all the beneficial insects that are going to help the pests from taking it over. So I think it's, that's a great idea as well. All right, we have one last question here. Uh, the book about Florida weeds, what was that title? Yeah, she's gonna go get it. And there was also somebody who was a asking about marmeco fights, which was something I had never heard of before, but it's pretty much a type of plant from South America. Um, there's ants that live in it. It has, 
you know, South American plants are great in South America. Um, don't ever introduce something into an ecosystem that you don't know about so well. We do have native acacias as well, though. Um, there are uh, acacia plants native to Florida. Um, sweet acacia and cinnacord are two great ones that grow uh, in this area. Um, and we have plenty of ants already. We don't need any more. Fire ants are invasive, if you guys don't know that. Um, so we don't need any more exotic South American ants. We have plenty as uh, already. And we do have some native acacias. So that was, uh, somebody had asked that question a little while ago. Oh, uh, here's the, yeah, this is, it's from the University of Florida. It's an awesome book. Um, so it's interesting. It was, it was actually, it's called Weeds and Southern Turf Grass. So it was actually written specifically for people trying to take care of their turf. Um, it was, I want to say it was written sometime in the late eighties, early nineties. So, you know, uh, but there's some really good things in there about identifying grasses. And the funny thing is I'm looking at it. Oh, you know, we actually sell a couple of those plants now at the nursery. So I think so many of these things have actually been completely wiped out and there's not these, these uh, native areas with things like, for example, in this book is blanket flower and, um, and violet and all these beautiful plants that um, people had seen for weeds as weeds for so long. And now, Oh, where are they? Their environment is gone. Their habitat is gone. So people are going into stuff like this and saying, okay, what was once a weed, essentially a plant you don't want, is now something I would really love to see because it's a beautiful flower and it's beneficial and it's it's sense of place. It's Florida. So, but yeah, it's called uh, Weeds of Southern Turf Grasses and it's a University of Florida book. And I, I love it. It's really good. <laughs> it's a really good book. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was great. Um, and if you have any questions or you'd like to contact us for our services, um, we'd be really happy to help you out. And um, this webinar was recorded and we will go ahead and send a recording out to everybody that registered and a couple of resources as well that we talked about if you're curious about book titles or other um, sources for information. Thank you, guys. It's a lot of fun. Thank you, Amanda, for putting us Thank on. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night. Thank you for all the questions.